welcome to another episode of the Odd Lots podcast. I'm Joe Weisenthal. Unfortunately, my co-host Tracy Alloway is off today. Nonetheless, we're going to hopefully have a an important conversation about gasoline. It's uh, been on this pretty big tumble over the last two months, but I still sense that, you know, okay, it's sort of tied to the price of oil. Oil prices have come in, but it feels like there's a lot more to it than just the oil price. It certainly doesn't move in just lockstep with oil. There's refining, there's regional variations, there's variations from one gas station to another, literally right next door. So there's, at least to me still, there's still a lot of mystery about like why the price of gas is what it is. Why does it always seem to end in 99 cents? I've never like gotten an answer to that. Uh, whether it's 2.99 or 3.99 or 4.99 seems to be popular. All these things, you know, gas is so central. It's so central to the economy. Ever since gas started going down, prices started going up. Biden's approval ratings started ticking up when gas prices started falling. And of course, vice versa. The price of gas feels like it's determinant of almost everything these days in American life. And so why don't we learn like what causes the price of uh, gasoline? So to answer all of our questions, or I guess in this case, just all of my questions, I want to bring in Patrick DeHaan. He is the head of petroleum analysis at GasBuddy, which is a service that provides price tracking for consumers, tells them where the different prices are at different stations around them. He's been uh, at GasBuddy for 13 years. He knows everything about the price of gasoline. And if you follow him on Twitter, he is always answering in a pretty uh, direct manner what's going on with gasoline and when he's when price is going up. Republicans love him and uh, talk about how uh, terrible the White House is doing. And when the price is going down, everybody flips sides. And meanwhile, he keeps it uh, apolitical and just says, this is going on with gasoline, even though it's so so uh, central to what's going on. So, uh, Patrick, thank you so much for coming on Odd Lots. Thanks for having me. It's uh, certainly always fun, uh, you know, when prices go up or down to see yeah. the, the movements and watch all the politicians change sides, <laughs> right? And, and one minute it's great and the next it's not. The, the, I mean, that is my impression just from watching your Twitter handle. Like you're like talking about the price of gasoline and suddenly you see so viscerally how central gasoline is to say American politics by essentially like who is attacking you at any given moment for just for just tweeting out the news. Yeah, that's that's really true. People have a problem with prices going up and they have a problem with them then coming back down. And, you know, one side likes when prices go up or yeah. down. It's you know, it, it's become very political. We'll just say it that way. Well, let me ask you a question that is, I don't think, political at all, but so it's a super basic question, but is it the core of what you do at Gas Buddy? And I also think it can maybe help us like almost like work backwards and figuring out the price of gas. But if if your app essentially compares, well, what is gas at uh, this corner station versus maybe what you could get if you drive three blocks away or 10 blocks away, it immediately raises the question like, why is gas the price of gasoline different at one station to another? Why is there variation within gas stations very close to each other? Well, and it, it's really loaded uh, and very complex. I'll try to dumb it down, but essentially okay. gasoline, like oil and, and other commodities, the prices that stations are paying will change on a daily basis. Right. There may be different suppliers, there's different competitors. So essentially, at the station level, stations are all paying something different depending on the timing of how much they're buying, who they're buying from. And with oil so volatile this year, because of a lot of these high-level factors, recovery from COVID, Russia's war in Ukraine, the overall economy, right. the price of, of oil and gasoline has been gyrating violently. So one station may get at 25 cents a gallon less than another. Mm. And so that goes into you know these various hotspots. But stations also, when prices have been declining as they've been for the last nine weeks, stations have incredible latitude to either lower their prices very quickly as their cost goes down or kind of more slowly, depending on if they got the timing right this year. Stations may have a different financial position. That is, they may be hurting when prices went up because, as many people do not know, it's oftentimes very hard to be the first one to pass along the price increase. So stations take it on the chin when prices go up and when prices go down, they're in less of a hurry to lower prices. And that can create some of these hot spots where there may be in a very aggressive gas station that wants to lower prices and some others may not be so aggressive. And that 
can cause a lot of variety in, in what you're paying locally. I don't know if there is an average gasoline station. I'm sorry. These are going to be all very – we might just do 30 minutes of like extremely rudimentary questions about how gasoline works. So I hope <laughs> that's cool with you. But I don't know if there is an average gas station. But to the best you can answer the question, how often do gas stations themselves – get a refill and how close to the bottom of their own tanks do they get typically before a refill? Like mm -hmm. how do gas stations play that? Well, it, it depends on the size of the gas station. Some mom okay. and pops may simply order when they need more. Whereas the pros, the, the, the companies that may own many stations may have somebody that buys fuel and looks at markets to know when to time it right. It's like an airfare, right? The airfares change on a daily basis. And if right. you want to fly, you're just going to buy an airfare. Whereas if you're buying a lot of airfare, you may weigh a day, or, uh, a day or two. So, you know, at the station level, stations are kind of adjusting their prices, looking at that. But, you know, it, it's, uh, again, going back to the volatility, it's, it's been such a crazy year that not every station has that competitive advantage where somebody can just watch the price that they pay. So, uh, bigger stations that have more stores may have a leg up in terms of having, you know, somebody that may be in a position mm. to simply watch the markets and to be able to time purchases right. But when prices have gone down, it's all very subject to, to competition, how quickly prices go down. There's there's just so many things that go into it. But ultimately, now we've seen prices go down for nine weeks. And I think the most frequent thing I've been asked in the last nine weeks is, why is X town you know, X cents per gallon lower than mine. And it really has to do with just competition and whether or not there's like a status quo yeah. or if there's a wholesale club, if they're aggressive and lowering price, it, it, it certainly varies widely. I was wondering about the competition question. If there's like a town with lots of gas stations and lots of consumer choice, can you sort of empirically show that there is more gas price volatility or maybe more aggressiveness on pricing than say, a single gas station mm -hmm. like in the middle of Death Valley, California, that no one else can, you know, it's your only chance to fill yeah. up for another hundred miles. Well, it, it's really fascinating because oftentimes we find that the solo gas stations by themselves are generally the ones that may charge a little bit more, but there are exceptions to the rule. And it may happen more often than motorists realize mm. that that there's an exception. I think there's a couple stations that I watch that are aggressively lowering prices and they are all by themselves. So I think the majority, like you said, if you're in the, if you're in the middle of, of, of Death Valley, you have a captive audience and prices yeah. are more likely to be above average in that situation. But there are some holdouts in the country that I can say this station is so low, but it's also bringing prices down in the majority of stations that surround it miles away. Interesting. And why would that be? Like, is it what it, what would be the reason why a gas station that doesn't have a lot of competition in its proximity may still be aggressive on pricing? They may want to pull people in hmm. from a further distance away. You know, if you're if you're a couple miles down the road and and your station is not in the best geological location to pull traffic in. Yeah. People that use the gas buddy app may see that you have a low price two miles down the road. And so some of those low prices can lure people in. Economists must always be wanting, uh, they must always be trying to get your data because I could imagine there are a lot of interesting sort of like real world tests that can be seen from it about the degree to which transparency in pricing affects markets themselves because you know maybe like okay these days you're like oh i will drive two miles down the road to get cheaper gasoline because the gas buddy app says i can uh, uh save 10 cents a gallon or something like that but at one point in the past consumers just didn't even have that knowledge and so perhaps pricing discrepancies or divergences could persist longer yeah you know there is a lot of market for this data potentially you know not only from you know entities that want to watch this and better understand it but stations may you know want to to look at their own station data and compare it to their their competition as well to make sure they have an edge so i mean there's a heavy market for this i mean it's information yeah. and you know gas prices are are so prevalently priced you, you can't escape them and, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I think there probably is a lot of interest from the consumer level to the business that wants to be as, as, as aggressive as possible and 
they want to know that their price is the lowest, right? I think that's, if anything is true of a lot of stations is they want to compete, they want to have the lowest price and they want to make sure their price is below the competition. What about the question of margins? How much do gas stations make actually selling retail gasoline above wholesale typically? And then does it change much for gas stations that have significant ancillary businesses? Some gas stations are literally just like a guy yeah. in a little, you know, in a tiny building and one pump, whereas then you have others mm -hmm. with lots of pumps, but then there's a food court inside uh, the gas, uh, gas station and gifts and other things like that, in which case bringing people in, maybe you lose money yeah. on the gas, but you can make a lot of money on selling drinks and stuff like that. Well, there's a perfect example. You mentioned food court and I went right to it, right? Some of the wholesale clubs that exist, they will take uh, a much thinner margin. That is, they'll make five or 10 cents a gallon instead of 20 cents a gallon, or even, you know, maybe 15 cents to get you to the location. Yeah. Because what better way to get you to their store to buy 50 rolls of, of toilet paper or right. a 48 pack of your favorite drink than to get you there with a low price. So there is absolutely a difference in agenda. And some stations will have a lower price to get you to their location whether it's a wholesale club or one of these large format gas stations that are extremely popular, you know, they'll have a whole, you know, slew of, of different food options. So price right. is a great way to get people to your location. And then, as you mentioned, to go in the store where margins are higher, but th those locations, they'll still make some money. It may be five, 10, 15 cents a gallon compared to the competition could be 20 to 30 cents. And now those margins, even at the big outlets will vary depending on what's going on. You talk about, you know, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the yeah. wholesale price of, of, of oil and gasoline varying. There will be times of the year, very brief times, that a station could make in excess of 50 cents a gallon. Now, wow. that's not normal, right? That is extremely abnormal. I would say that over the course of the year, a well-run station will average a margin of between 20 and 30 cents a gallon, which isn't a whole lot. And right. keep in mind, when prices are higher, they're going to make less margin because those interchange fees, if you're using a credit or debit card, there's a cost to station owners that they, they don't often or all the time pass along to you. And, and that fee goes up as the price of gasoline has been higher. Wait, I hadn't even I hadn't even thought about that. So what happens the higher the nominal price of gasoline, uh, they have to pay a higher uh, higher check to the uh, to the to the credit card companies. Exactly. It's very much like a commission. You know, you sell a home that's worth a million dollars, your commission two and a half percent is a heck of a lot more selling the million dollar home that is a hundred thousand dollar home. So as the price of gasoline goes up, those interchange fees charged by credit card companies are taking more a bite out of a station's profit. That's really interesting. I hadn't I hadn't thought about that. So is it true, but it, it is true sort of empirically that we can see that the 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 gas stations if they're attached to something that sells more, whether it's a large format gas station, like a Bucky's that people want to go into because they have clean bathrooms and food, or a Costco or a Walmart, well, maybe, or where maybe they'll sell you like you know a bunch of rolls of uh, toilet paper as well. Those consistently have lower prices than a sort of small mom and pop or a place that sells nothing but gas. Exactly. Not only do they have the different agenda, keep their prices down, but they may have pricing power too. I mean, there's definitely an incentive for a refiner that's producing gasoline to make a deal with a big club like uh, uh, a Costco or a Bucky's because their volume throughput, they can help that refinery, you know, sell through more of its gasoline. So uh, those bigger stations, those bigger format stations sell more, they can have a lower price uh, because the refinery may be more incentivized to, to make a better contract offer with them as an outlet to get rid of that fuel. Would these be national contracts that a company like Walmart or Costco or Bucky's, which is, I guess, sort of regional, but some sort of contract, like a blanket contract that would affect all of their locations? Or would it be a series of contracts with regional refiners? It, you know, it can be both. It depends on the scope of, of the refiner. If that refiner has refineries in every region where the store has outlets, it could be in every market. But oftentimes that's not the case. You may not have a, a shell refiner in the West Coast, but you may have a shell refinery in Texas. So sometimes it may be localized to different regions, depending on what refineries operate in, in a given region.
want to get to more of the sort of refining question and how the degree to which refining adds to the price of gasoline. But before we do, you know, get you you often tweet you're like, oh, the most common. What is the most common price of gasoline right now? We're recording this on um, August 16th. But what's the most common price of gasoline in America right now? Well, let's take a look here. As, as I look, uh, we're at 349 is the most common price across the U.S. Uh, and, and they're all ending with a nine. I mean, and why is that? And that's psychology. just like, yeah, yeah. So is that just as obvious as it seems that it's like it looks better to say 399 than four or 349 than 350? It's like it really is. <laughs> it really is. You know, no hard. I'd be hard pressed to find any station that ends in a zero because why end in a zero 350, for example, yeah. sounds a whole lot worse than 349. So everyone's going to take the nine instead of the zero. And you never see a 401. Have you ever seen one? I mean, I I've seen a 401. It always has me scratching my head. Like, <laughs> why don't you stay at 403 and then make the jump to 399? Yeah. You know, that's really funny. So that's all psychology how much like sort of like broad regional difference is there in america depending on whether say you're in iowa versus somewhere you know in an expensive Cal part of california i know i'm pretty sure gasoline is very expensive in hawaii where it has to be uh all yeah. has to be shipped in maybe the i don't even know the word how many like price regions are there in the u.s Th there's five and okay. that's defined by uh an acronym pad uh, Petroleum Administration for Defense District. And that goes back to World War II when we sliced the country into five pieces for strategic purposes. Okay. And now those those regions define, you know, the, there's different supply and demand aspects in each one of those regions. And to your point, each one of the regions has a different price based on the supply and demand balance in that region. And it's all defined by, you may hear about the NYMEX, the New, Mor the New York Mercantile Exchange. Yeah. They trade gasoline. And then under that, Every region trades at a different basis to what that one overlying market is. And that basis can be minus, meaning a region could have a discount hmm. if they are well supplied and if things are running well. Some regions can have a, a premium or a surcharge based on if supply is extremely tight. And every region right now, as I look at it, between the highest and lowest, there's about a 50 cent a gallon difference on gasoline. Well, if you include the West Coast, it's even more dramatic, a 75 cent a gallon difference between the cheapest market, which is the Gulf Coast, and that's because there's a lot of refineries there and there's right. a lot of supply, and the West Coast, which is the highest because of the opposite. There's not a lot of refineries. They have special blends of gasoline in California. So even there, you're going to see a, a pretty wide gap between the nation's cheapest and most expensive because even at the basis, the base level, yeah. there's a huge gap, a 75-cent gap between the lowest and the highest region. So what is it in the Louisiana pad right now? And what is it on the West Coast, like in terms of average prices? Well, you know, not taking into consideration tax or okay. yeah, pipeline right. tariffs. So transportation distribution, the wholesale price in the Gulf Coast today is about two fifty seven a gallon. Now, okay. if you throw tax and tariffs on, that's where you get a lot of these states. Texas right now, the statewide average is 342. So you're always going to see a retail price that's quite a bit higher because taxes usually slap on about 60 cents a gallon. But that 257 in the Gulf Coast, in the San Francisco, the Northern California market, California is broken to Northern and Southern. The Northern California market, the same price of, of what fuel they use is 325 a gallon. So 257 in the cheapest community, the Gulf Coast, and 325 in the most expensive market, which is Northern California. So the hierarchy of prices in the United States, like you start with this NYMEX price. Is that the RBOB future? That's exactly it. It's NYMEX RBOB is the foundation and everyone will trade at a premium or a discount to that NYMEX, NYMEX RBOB contract. Okay. So here's another question. I am looking right now at the generic first month NYMEX RBOB contract, ticker XB1 commodity on the terminal. Now the price is not quoted in per gallon. It says two ninety is the current price. What is that like? What is the basic volume unit of that contract? How many gas? How many gallons are there? Is that a hundred of those contracts? Yeah. And 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 I'm I'm assuming you're looking at the front month right now. Yeah, I'm I am, showing yeah. on my screen is September. Yeah. Of of 2022. Yeah. Looking at the the specifications of that contract. You're talking about 42,000 gallons, which is a thousand barrels. Okay. Is a contract. That's kind of the basic contract. Now, 
the right. CME, which the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, NYMEX as well, they've done mini contracts, so you don't have to bet as much, but or, or buy as much. But that's mm-hmm. the base contract is a thousand barrels of gasoline, which is forty two thousand gallons. Oh, oh, I see. I'm looking at it now. I'm looking at the description of the contract. So there's forty two thousand gallons, and it looks like one contract value is actually one hundred and twenty two or one hundred twenty one thousand nine hundred twenty six dollars for one slug of gasoline. So the hierarchy goes, there's the NYMEX price, then there's a, the five pad regions in which there's usually some sort of basis above that, although in theory at times, if there's a lot of inventory in region, it can be below. And then that's determined by various uh, pipelines and other costs and proximity to refineries. And then there are the state taxes. And there's one thing you left out, and it's it's even another uh, complicating factor. Sure. Our Bob is reformulated gasoline. Oh, we call them kind of the Bobs. It's a family. Our oh, Bob is reformulated. Bob you have C Bob is conventional blend stock for oxygen at blending. That's what Bob means. Blend stock for oxygen at blending, meaning that you have to add uh, an oxygen to it. Something like ethanol. We used to use MTBE, but something. Uh, like that. And so you have RBOB reformulated, CBOB conventional. And out in California, it's California RBOB. So California Air Resources Board has its own requirements. So out in California, it's CARBOB. CARBOB. I assume there's some sort Lower of Lower emissions, cleaner burning. That What regulates the BOBs is the RVP, the read vapor pressure, which measures volatility of fuel. How easy that fuel may, uh, or I should say the pressure uh, of of emissions from burning a gallon of fuel. So summer gasoline has lower RVP. That means the fuel doesn't give off as much emissions when it's burned. So it's less volatile. And because temperatures can interact with that, you know, in the the summer months, you see ozone action days, right? Because the airborne temperature, the ambient temperature interacts with those emissions to create more ozone. And so lower RVP is important to clean the air up. And depending on where you are, California has the most stringent requirements for RVP, 5.99, whereas some of the bigger cities use 7.0 PSI RVP. And some of the the conventional gasoline for summer use is 9.0 pounds or PSI RVP. So Mm. the cleaner the gasoline, the lower the RVP. And then when we move into winter, the standards go up to 13.5 and 15 is kind of the default RVP. So 15 PSI in the winter, nine PSI in the summer. And the, the lower the RVP, the more you pay because the cleaner it burns, the components are cleaner, less volatile and costlier. So I'm looking right now, again, I like this game of you describing something in gasoline and me trying to find a ticker for it and see if this makes sense. So I'm looking at a chart now on the terminal it says LA 85.5 October Carbob prompt difference index. I think it's prompt. And right now it's 19 cents. So does that mean that, if that sounds right, does that mean that there's a 19 cent premium for the California blend basically of gasoline right now? Yeah, that's that. You're looking at the the, the, the basis difference. Yeah. So NYMEX right now is 290. Yep. Uh, if you're looking live. And the basis difference for LA is 19 cents. There so that go. would put the car bob price at 309. And that doesn't include tax. Right. So that you're finding the, the basis, that's the differentiator between whether your region is paying a premium or getting a discount to that New York mercantile contract. And like I said, the West Coast is generally a very tight market. Yeah. So it's rare to see a discount in the right. summer months in the West Coast. Whereas it's rare to see the Gulf Coast ever be at a premium because there's so many refineries down there that the market is generally well supplied. But if there's a major hurricane shutting those Gulf Coast refineries down, you can see a premium for Gulf Coast gasoline. And by the way, all these various foundations, these basis points, that encourages refineries to send gasoline to these regions. I was just going to ask about that exact question. So to what degree can refineries shift the distribution of gasoline depending on where there's a premium in a different in a in a given region well they can do that indiscriminately where pipelines exist now the west coast is essentially cut off from the rest of the country pipelines mm-hmm. flow east to las vegas and west into phoenix so there's a little bit of a disconnect we always call the west coast a petro island because what's <laughs> produced there stays there 
and you can't easily bring material into the West Coast. It's probably faster for material to come from Japan or Singapore than it is from the Gulf Coast wow. going down to the Panama Canal, then going up the east, uh, you know, up the wow. California coast. Why so, is that? Well, I mean, the time it takes to load a ship in the Gulf Coast, go down through the Panama wow. Canal, and, and keep in mind the expense of sailing through the Panama Canal because right. it's, you know, it's expensive toll. Uh, and that may disadvantage your cost. But otherwise, much of the rest of the country is well connected. Hmm. Um, gasoline from the Gulf Coast can run up the Colonial Pipeline to the East Coast, and it ends in Linden, New Jersey. So right now, the East Coast has been extremely tight. An example, the New York Harbor market is trading at a 14 cent premium to NYMEX, whereas the Gulf Coast is trading at a 34 cent discount. That setup arbitrage opens the door for, for refineries in the Gulf Coast to send as much material into New York as they can because they get more money for it. But the space on the Colonial Pipeline is limited to the capacity. And right now, it would not be surprising, given that pretty wide difference, that that pipeline is fully allocated, meaning it's out of the room. The Colonial Pipeline, that was the one that got hacked last year, right? And it was yes, a total- What it happened was. that how did uh, the distribution of gas move as a function of that pipeline having been shut down for a few days? Well, it, it didn't really move. And that was the problem. Now there's right. intermediate storage containers, right? At the big terminals, you see those white tanks above the ground that can hold hundreds of thousands, if not millions of gallons of fuel. I think most of the problem from the Colonial was not actually the disruption in the flow of fuel, but how motorists responded in a panicked way to exacerbate the the you know the disruption of fuel supply people went out there i mean we, we saw the photos people with plastic shopping bags filling up a plastic bag with gasoline and so motorists overwhelmed even under normal times when there's not issues they overwhelm the system i'm going to throw out a percentage i think of the outages that people experienced because of the colonial 95 percent of those outages were probably induced by how motorists responded. And 5% of the outages were probably because of the stoppage of the pipeline. So <laughs> it becomes down to human yeah. behavior, which exacerbated the situation. But we probably would have made it through there with limited disruptions. But you know, once, once the beast was out there in terms of right. once people thought that there was gonna be disruption, everyone ran for the pop. All right, we just have a couple more minutes left. I want to wrap up. But, you know, refining capacity has been a really big macro topic. How much of a spread the sort of diminishment of refining capacity has caused, you know, on top of the price of crude oil, then it has to be refined into gasoline. Lots of talk about an early shutdown of refiner refineries, especially during 2020 when there was this collapse in gasoline demand. How much do you think that's appreciated? And in your view, how much has the constraint of refining capacity contributed to, well, really like the huge upward move that we saw beginning uh, uh, that sort of culminated in June? Well, I'd say a lot of it was due to maybe not necessarily, you know, the lack of refining capacity, human strength. Right. All of the trades you see, the way the market's moving is because humans are behind it, trading based on the, 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 the tangible value. And the problem is, is when you start to run out of capacity, it freaks the market out because obviously if, if supply or, or demand exceeds supply, you know, prices are going to be on a runaway. And, and, and so the market tends to be less measured in its response when you start to see, you know, this 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 territory where there's just an inability to keep up with demand, the market panics and prices start to escalate out of control because, you know, it's fear-based. So people get out of control and, and the market goes up, 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 and up. And, and so having said that, it's really important that we have spare capacity for both oil producers and refining. And by the way, that $150 barrel price in 2008, part of the reason why that happened is because we ran out of spare capacity. Yeah. So the market just went out of control, it overheated, which inherently caused Americans and the global economy to stop using as much. And then we finally got our, our, our spare capacity back. But this has been a story. And again, it's happening now at the refinery level because of COVID and because the, the nation has been moving away from EVs. But I think that's a big reason why prices did get so out of control. Yeah. 
is because of the possibility that that supply was not going to keep up with demand. But we're going to need right. more refinery capacity. The good news is it's coming online here in the next couple of years. Oh, that's good. All right. Final question. What is going on with demand levels right now? Because a lot of people are questioning this EIA data, which shows that somehow demand is below 2020 levels, which makes no sense because at that point, there were still tons of people not going anywhere. What's going on with demand? And what's going on with that data we're getting from the EIA? Well, and, and first of all, it's important to understand the methodology, okay. right? It, you don't just look at the number and say, oh, this is, you have to dig into what the number represents. And for the EIA, it's the best number that they can get. They okay. measure, you know, the, the pipelines, the tanks, the, the moving of products. So their, their metric is called implied demand or product supply. Okay. Right. You're, you're basically saying the market's consuming this much because we see this much moving through these tanks, but it's not the perfect gauge because stations have intermediate storage facilities too that are not measured by the EIA. Hmm. So stations could be sitting on more or less gasoline depending on the situation, right? Because there's intermediate storage devices that the EIA doesn't measure. So gas buddy actually looks at demand at the retail dispenser. And so our data doesn't line up with EIA because EIA could be flawed in that maybe when prices are plummeting, stations are going to say, we're not going to buy 10,000 gallons today. We're going to buy 2,000 gallons today. And then in three days when prices are lower. And the EIA's data then would say there's less demand because they don't see stations, right? Stations are slowing down yeah. their purchases to get ahead of pricing differences, whereas our data continues to look at fuel dispensed at the retail station. So it's important to understand the EIA's methodology. Yeah. There is inherent flaws. They just look at it differently. Right. Your data do. does and not, we, your data shows robust demand. It, it, it shows healthy demand, certainly not at record levels. And now we're starting okay. to see demand seasonally decline. Okay. But that's where we are. It's it's not as weak as what the EI has been uh, suggesting recently. Patrick DeHaan, I've been wanting to uh, get 30 minutes of your time for a long time to learn, <laughs> to, the, you know, all these rudimentary, the dumb questions about the price of gasoline, like why is it different in one place? Hey, there's no dumb questions. And, you know, this is my favorite <laughs> thing to do. It's just there's, there's not a whole lot of solid answers out there and there's a lot of curiosity. And that's, you know, that's how I got into this too. So, well, really appreciate you coming on Odd Lots. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, that was really fun talking to Patrick. I wish I could banter with Tracy for a few minutes, but I did find that really helpful because, A, I'd always been really curious about things like, well, how much margin is there for a gas station? What are the advantages for a gas station that uh, sells other stuff besides gasoline? What is the pricing power of the large chains of gasoline stations? Why is there such regional variation? So all of these questions, Patrick answered very well. Also, that EIA thing, that's been getting a lot of attention because people are looking at this falling price of gasoline. They're like, oh, yeah, it's because the economy is falling off a cliff. People are driving less than they were in 2020. I don't think that's correct. Intuitively, it doesn't seem right. And as Patrick noted, the gas buddy data does not show that kind of collapse at all. Although I guess we are past the peak of the summer driving season. So really fun talking to Patrick. And I guess we will leave it there. This has been another episode of the Odd Lots podcast. I'm Joe Weisenthal. You can follow me on Twitter at The Stalwart. Follow my co-host, Tracy Alloway, at Tracy Alloway. Follow Patrick DeHaan, at Gas Buddy Guy. Follow our producer, Carmen Rodriguez, at Carmen Armin. And check out all of our podcasts at Bloomberg under the handle at Podcasts. Thanks for listening. 